Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're looking at a first submission by Olivia of the horse Chinook. Chinook is a horse that Olivia has been leasing, evidently, for a little while, and she said in the beginning he was very tense and having difficulties like that, and uh, since doing this work he has come around, and what I'd like to say is uh, you're doing a great job. So this is a really good video that I really enjoyed watching. Here already you have a really nice walk right there. And it just goes on. Now, this walk could be a little more swinging once you get to that place. You can ask for a little bit more. But that's certainly a wonderful start. And you're doing just the right thing here as his head comes up. You just widen your hand so he doesn't lose contact. And as he goes back down, you let that contact go back to just the weight of the rein. And here it's just slightly more than the weight of the rein. In other words, it's like letting the horse take the contact. He lifts up, and it's, and it's the horse who actually increases the pressure on his mouth, if you will, a little bit. And so they quickly learn that when they go back down, ah, that releases back to the weight of the rein, which is where they want to be. Remember that no horse wants to have someone pulling constantly on its mouth, which is, of course, why we've seen so much riding deteriorate in the last number of years as we've watched our organizations uh, like the FEI and the American Horse Association or the United States Equestrian Team, as they now call themselves, Fancy name, but everything has been uh, very much dumbed down since they got their new fancy name. And we've allowed a lot of very bad things to begin to happen in the world of horse showing. And a lot of looking the other way, if you will. So once again, it's just that idea of no horse is ever going to be like, like having its mouth pulled on. Why would they, of course? And that's, in the past, everyone knew that that meant punishing the horse. You were punishing it if you were pulling on its mouth all the time. But now that's become the way people ride, and they're mystified when you know when the horse suddenly doesn't want to do anything. Go to any horse shows these days and watch what goes on in the warm-up arena. But look how beautiful this horse is. So no horse is ever going to relax until you let go of its mouth or stop pulling backwards on it, which you have done, and that's why you've seen the change happen in your horse. So that was really nice walk work there. And you did just the right thing of not trying to make a perfect transition. You just got the horse to a good place, and then you just started into a trot, and now you're working with what you have to work with there. And right away, the horse is coming around beautifully. So the beauty is we want to not, I, we see people all the time frustrating themselves because the horse doesn't have a good walk, and it doesn't have a good trot, and then, they, <laughs> then they're mystified when the horse doesn't have a good transition. Well, it's not going to, and the more you try to work on those transitions, the worse it's going to get. As the horse becomes better and more consistent over its back, as you have already found, the problems in the transitions will just disappear all by themselves. They're not something that you have to, uh, contrary to popular belief, do over and over again. In fact, the more you do them, the worse the horse becomes. So remember, it's always about getting in a steady rhythm, getting the horse in the flow. It's like playing music. Imagine if going to a, a symphony and, you know, and the orchestra was going slow, fast, slow, fast, you know, and half of them out of tune. Well, that's kind of what, like, what the horse business looks like very often today. Very, very out of tune instruments. So in order for your horse to be in tune, we might say, the horse must be working over its back. Then we find that we're able to maintain a steady rhythm generally, or a steadier rhythm. But the way you're going about this is exactly what you should do. Widening your hands as the horse comes up and down. And this is a technique that we use in the beginning. Once again, this is not what we do when we go to a horse show. It's what we do when we're schooling horses and teaching these, these techniques. Once they learn them, then there's very little up and down, if you will. Because the more we work in this manner, the easier it is to work in this manner, because the horse realizes, as you've learned, that you know, nothing is going to hurt him, and they feel good in their bodies. Horses want to feel good in their bodies. Just like we see now so many videos um, and little clips being sent in from people of their horses out loose and all of a sudden their horses are working over their backs when they're loose and uh, that's what we want to see. This is how nature intended a horse to move. No horse you know, in nature would ever do the things that we see being done to it these days and of course the idea of dressage was that it was based on the three natural gates of the horse and developing those natural gates. Not in, creating artificial gates like they do in Tennessee walkers and saddlebreds and things like that. And sadly, that's what we see uh, happening in dressage. When you see these horses doing these exaggerated front leg extensions and the back legs aren't coming through, that's really an artificial gate. As soon as the horse disengages from back to front, you're doing something that's no longer a natural gate. But this is absolutely beautiful what you're doing here. You know, and this is not a horse that uh, is a huge, huge mover. But look how much better he moves. The more he stretches, 
I'm always watching the hawks to see whether they're making a round circle or not. But then, of course, that somewhat has fooled people these days because these very expensive horses being bred today, they still look like they have a pretty good hawk movement because they're built so well behind. Um, so it fools people a little bit, and the hawks seem to keep moving even when the horses are upside down. But, of course, it's the horse's longevity that tells the story about what's happening there. Uh, that is, once again, if your horse is going lame after two, work, two years of work or a year of work or six months or whatever the case may be, your dressage hasn't been very good, being that being the whole idea of dressage in the beginning was, you know, how can we best work horses to make them last as long as possible and make them happy in the work? As Bill Steinkraus said, it's never going to be very good if they don't like it, and no horse is ever going to like it if you're pulling on their mouths and kicking them all the time. But when we work judiciously, and they have a very good sense of what's right and wrong, you know, when a horse does something wrong, and it knows it, you know, and and we give them a little tap with the whip, they immediately smarten up. And of course, we have to give again. And then our punishment, if you will, has been judicious, and the horse will not resist that. But if you're punishing it because it's not doing something, and yet you're still pulling on its mouth and trying to hold it into some phony frame, the horse is just going to get sourer and sourer and deader to the leg and deader to the mouth and then you start getting more whips, um, and you see people riding around with spurs on both legs and two whips, and at the same time they're pulling and yanking on the horse's mouth, and the horse's ears are pinned back. So those are all signs of that, those, of that confliction within the horse, that is, the, when, when the rider is conflicting the aids. But this is really good, what you're doing here. I like your position. I love how you're keeping yourself very upright. Notice as she's coming up and down in the saddle that it's her hips are coming up and forward, not her shoulders. The shoulders are staying pretty much where they are, and that's exactly what we want to see. I like how your leg is down and wrapping around the horse, and you're keeping your heel down most of the time, except when you're using it. And of course, remember, whenever we use the leg, we always use the calf of the leg first, and then if we want to get a little more lift in the back, then we bring our heel in and give the horse a little upwards touch underneath the belly. But that's also why it's so important that we ride horses that are... a uh, appropriate size for us. That is, if you can't get your leg down below the break in the side of the horse where it starts to fall back in again, um, your riding will never be very effective and, and never very safe because a horse, a rider who is uh, too short for the horse that they're riding, that is, their leg doesn't come down beyond that middle section of the back as it slopes in. Um, that's part of what keeps us around on the horse. If you see how this rider, she comes around there from behind, you see how her legs are wrapped around the horse. That's what keeps you on. So the horse leaps into the air. The fact that your legs without any tension but are around the horse, that will literally keep you from flying out of the saddle. So always remember that, you know, we want to ride horses that are appropriate size for us and not frustrate ourselves by riding something that you that you can't ride or or you're putting yourself in a dangerous situation by doing so. But everything you're doing here is very good. I'm I'm uh very impressed with how far you've come by yourself here, so this is very good. And once again, every time he comes up a little bit, you just correct it correctly. I see you put your leg on. As soon as he stretches down, you relax again. If he comes up, you widen your hand. So you're doing all this very, very well. I like how as he stretches deep, watch how he then, then allows us to bring our hands together. Once again, once horses get in a phase where they're doing this all the time, then you don't have to do so much of this, or at all, the hand widening thing that you're doing. Once again, it's just a technique that we use to teach the horse. But really good there. And notice that as he's gone on, you can see how it happens when he slows down. You can see how he starts to pull with his front legs a little bit when he comes up. Then as soon as he stretches down, we see how the shoulder begins to swing more freely, and that allows the thrust of the, of the hind legs to push up into that round back and lift the front end off the ground. And remember, that's what real collection is. It's just a higher degree of the same thing. Once the horse begins to lift the front end through the thrust of the hind leg, then it just simply becomes able to do that more and more. And that's what real collection is. So what we lose in forward motion, we gain in lift in the stride. So the stride becomes elevated, but not elevated at the knees, elevated in the back. In other words, the whole, horse, the whole front end of the horse is lifted, not just the horse's knees. That's why we have to not be confused, like watching old videos. You've got to remember that dressage, as we think of it now, the knowledge for this only began at the end of the 19th century. 
uh, there, that people really understood all of this through all the studies that were done at the Spanish Riding School in Mafra in Portugal and the Cadre Noir in France, that these schools were studying all this because it made a big difference. That's why militaries uh, had these schools of equitation, because the world used to run on horseback, and it was very important, you know, for their armies to know that, you know, their horses could make the distance. Same thing with saddles now. You see, saddle makers are going back and looking at these oldest saddles, like the McClellan cavalry saddle that um, people are going back and looking. They were made out of wood. They had a wooden tree, but you could ride a horse 100 miles in them because they were very wide through the gullet. So, you know, the, the, they knew back then how to put the saddle support area, you know, where the saddle support area was. And they designed those saddles to do that because they didn't. There's no way. If you went out and tried to ride 100 miles in most of the saddles that people ride in today with the little narrow gullets and blockings of the shoulders and things that we see, you'd never get anywhere. So that was all very good. Look at this beautiful walk it comes back to now. So for what this horse is, uh, you're, you've done a wonderful job and he's going to continue to develop into something very, very beautiful as time goes on. And that's the good news about all of this, you know. If, as long as a horse is sound, you'll be amazed as you go on here of what horses can develop into. Horses that seem rather coarse, as the case may be, or don't seem to have a lot of potential. But when we get them working correctly, it's pretty amazing what they can turn into. There are very few horses, actually, that are not capable of doing Grand Prix dressage, for instance, if the people are willing to go through what it takes the time necessary to develop them to that point. But it's just like people, you know, how many people start out in Olympics, I mean, in uh, gymnastics, for instance, as children. Very few of them ever get to the level, you know, necessary... <clears throat> to go to the Olympic Games at the highest possible level, but doing any amount of that kind of work correctly, gymnastic work, is going to improve a young person's body to a great deal and affect their health throughout their life, even though they may never become an Olympic champion at it, but they're still going to gain most of the, uh, most of the good effects of that happening, that is the correct muscular development. It's really nice here, and look how lovely he's swinging, he gets right there. I'm really looking forward to seeing you develop with this horse because this is uh, you're doing a really good job here. In another year, this horse will be doing wonderfully. Not that's not doing wonderfully now. I'm just talking about being ready to come up into a higher level, which they do all by themselves. Just always remember that if you're struggling and fighting the horse to get something done, it isn't worth doing because the horse simply is not ready. When a horse has been developed correctly to collect, it just collects. It's not something you have to fight the horse into doing. In fact, you, it's impossible to fight a horse into real collection. Very nice. Look as he stretches down, how that hock gets a little bit rounder. But this horse is tracking up very well, starting to track right into the tracks of the front feet to tell us we're well underway to developing good working gaits. Very nice there. And look how, when he gets to that position, that's where you want him. Now look how even everything looks there. And from that position, as the horse develops strength, he will just start to lift that front end off of the ground. In other words, you'll see a, the shoulders will even swing more freely than they are now. And remember, that's all about the thrust. And that's why it can only work if the horse's back is round, rounded upwards, that is because then the thrust of that hind leg can re be received in that round back and transmitted forward through the horse's body. If the horse is hollow in any way, its back is dropped in any way, then that's not going to happen. And what you'll see, as we see in so many upper level dressage horses today, they go to do Piaf and Passage and things like this, and, th and their back ends are coming up higher rather than maintaining this lowering. This is what we ultimately want. Once we have good working gaits, we begin to teach the horse through the Piaf um, some of them do it more naturally. They just start to sit down a little more in the stride. That is, they get more flexion in the three joints of the hind legs, just like you and I. If I stand and bend my knees, I can jump a lot higher into the, into the air. Well, that's exactly what we do with a horse. So that was really wonderful work, and that was about the right amount of it also. You're coming back to a really good walk again, letting the horse swing here. So all throughout our workout, we want to stop. Once again, I, I was, as soon as I feel the horse has done something better than it's done before, I'm going to come right back to the walk and give it a little break, let it stretch out again. Because remember, every time we really stretch the horse out, that really brings the blood flow through 
the body of the horse. Why so many of people's horses don't develop is they're so tense that there's never any blood through through their muscles and they keep them tense throughout the entire workout that they're doing. So remember, it's only when a muscle is relaxed and we come back and then the muscle can refresh itself. So a tense muscle has very little blood flowing through it. A relaxed muscle continues. To, and of course, that's just like if you were a runner, like if you can't oxygenate your muscles, you're going to wear out very quickly. So that's what this is all about. So some exercises that are extreme power exercises, like power lifters and things like this, that's why they don't, you don't power lift for a long time because they get their one shot at it and, you know, and, and it is the muscles have to tense a bit. And once they lose that oxygenation, then they, they know they're no longer firing the way that we want them to fire so that we can have that optimal amount of strength. So very important to come back and do just what you're doing here. So you're showing me a lot here that you've really learned a lot about patience. Your technique with your contact has become very good. You've understood this most important uh, aspect of learning how to widen your hands in these beginning things so that we can take up the slack. Because otherwise, when the horse is in this long stretch, obviously, they suddenly put their head up. It's very difficult to suddenly grapple up the reins. But if our reins are long enough, which yours are, and see how important that is to have reins. When the horse is all the way stretched, we need to still have about a foot or so of rain left so that we can quickly widen your, their hands the way you're doing there. Very nice work there. You can see sometimes with this horse that the back end looks a little bit stiff until he really starts to swing. So just know that all that will disappear as you get the horse working more actively and correctly as it develops strength. So you can see how when the head was up there, how all of a sudden, watch how the back end just stops working, even when it gets to right there. See how the back end is falling out behind. It's only when the horse goes into that stretch like it is now, and all of a sudden the horse is able to step forward again, and we see that more swinging active stride in some kind of rhythm. So always following, the horse is telling us what it needs to do. In other words, when the back drops and the hind end falls out behind, we know that we have to let the head and neck back down. And the horse even changes throughout even a, a session, you know, and it's again, once the horse is fresh, but when it starts to lose a little strength, that is, it, the muscles begin to fatigue, it's harder to maintain that. So we must let the neck down as far as it, we have to, to get that action white, like the way we want it. That is the horse continuing to step actively under the body and being able to lift up. That is lift its body through the thrust of the hind legs. Very nice, just like that. And of course, the beauty of the walk, once again, is that we can do a lot of the walk. So even though you're not uh, in the, the trot in the stretch right now, you're still developing a lot of muscle by just walking. As long as you can get a horse over its back, it's developing, whether it's in the walk, trot, or canter. And of course, conversely, if you can't, then all you're doing is tearing apart the joints. So remember, getting the horse over the back is what puts the shock absorbers on the horse. So once again, that's why so many horses today are going lame at such an early age. You go to almost any dressage barn today and three quarters of the horses are lame on any given day waiting for the next vet injection or whatever the case may be. You know, that should be people's indication that, you know, something is going seriously wrong. I know. I'm amazed that so many riders today think that it's normal that, you know, they're having to see the vet every week <laughs> for some reason or another. And even how many horses, remember if a horse is not over its back, it can very often be bridle lame. It can very often, I've seen people spend thousands of dollars trying to figure out what's wrong with their horse, and all that's wrong with it is either a bad fitting saddle or a hollow back. But unfortunately in today's world, you know, when we call veterinarians, even veterinarians have no idea how horses are supposed to move. And I highly recommend that when you choose a veterinarian, you talk to them and find out what they know. What do they understand about how horses develop? Because unfortunately, this work, you know, with very few exceptions, does not get taught in vet schools. Vet schools people teach people to put band-aids on horses and to fix things, but they often um, do not teach veterinarians what 
preventative medicine is, if you will, with horses, and that's what they should be doing. That's why I applaud the work of Gerd Hirschman, for instance, with his books that he's written and and uh, the, and all the ones who came before him, like Udo Berger's book, The Way to Perfect Horsemanship, which everyone should certainly read, and uh, I'm sure Mr. Hirschman read as well. I think he even uh, references that book. And um, Udo was a, uh, I believe, four-time gold medalist. Uh, he was the and on the German team, but he was also the team veterinarian. And uh, so once again, a very... Uh, a man who knew what he was doing and understood why horses were going lame. But unfortunately, you know, medical science now, but I always think it's very funny that I see these dressage shows where horses are all being brutalized and they're all sponsored by these drug companies that are doing all these leg injections. Well, of course they are because they're making fortunes off of this. If you knew how to ride correctly, you would. I would never inject a horse's joint, period. Joint injections are nothing but... Uh, inflammation reducer and painkillers shot into the horse's joints. It does not do anything. It is not a cure. It's just a temporary band-aid on the problem. And if you continue to do it after horses have been injected in their joints numerous times, the joints completely fall apart. And we've seen that over and over again these days. So again, that's why there's no older horses. By the time these horses get to Grand Prix these days, they've been injected so many times in their joints that they're completely shot when, when it's over. And of course, the problem with these joint injections are also not detectable, but they're drugging. They, they are a form of drugging horses, just like all the other drugs, but they're shot directly into the joints. So a lot of people are getting by. All of this should be outlawed. I mean, there's no way these joint injections should be legal at horse shows for people to, you know, one day the horse is lame. Like when you see a horse at a horse show, uh, as we've seen recently at the Olympics and some of these things where horses are dead lame one day and they're sound the next day. Well, what do you think happened? What happened was they took the horse back to the barn and injected every joint in its body to get it through another class. So once again, beware. And, you know, don't be afraid to, to uh, question the veterinarians that you are working with and ask them what they know, what they know about developing horses. Do they understand, you know, how a horse should move correctly through its back and what that does? And if they don't, by all means, find another veterinarian. But what you're doing here is really good work. Once again, we're back to a trot again. And we can see, I think the horse is starting to get a little tired now. And you're nearly the end of your, your workout. And that's where, where you should be at this point. But everything I'm seeing working here is just going very, very well. I'm liking your position. I'm liking how you're handling the reins and what you've done with this horse. So very, very good work. Right there. And how much, you know, once again, it's just so fun to watch horses change. You watch them come up and the back drops and all of a sudden they look like they can't move and you get them back in the position where you are here. And the horse looks like a million dollars, if you will. A really good work here. You know, and once again, once you understand that Everything is about getting the horse to move correctly. So, for instance, to take a riding lesson on a horse that isn't over its back is such a completely pointless exercise because all it teaches you is, is what you should not be doing, if you will. You know, and to spend time doing those things um, just doesn't do you any good. So right from the beginning, in the very first lesson people get, they should be, you know, they should talk about this and explain, a rider should, should be explained to right in the very beginning that there's a difference between having a horse working over its back and when it's not. It's kind of like surfing, you know, I, if you are, excuse me, somebody out on the water, interrupting my flow so good of job here. Sorry about that little thing there. What I was saying was, when if, when you learn to surf, you learn after the wave has broken. And it's very easy, but you can't stand up because once the wave is already broken, it's hard to stabilize the board. The same thing is true here when we ride a horse. If people are riding horses that are over their backs, because maybe it's, it's too dangerous to ride a horse over their back, or the horse hasn't been trained correctly to do that for a total beginner, then we thought they should be explained that this is how it is. It's like you're riding in the chop after the wave has broken. And as you get better, you're going to learn 
to ride in the big wave. And it's actually easier to ride a big wave because the board will stabilize you, just like we experience here. When horses get over their backs and really swing, it's easy to come out of the saddle. It's effortless to ride. But on the other hand, you know, there may be also why we have to train our horses, you know, to accept the work that we do calmly because when a horse is over its back, if it does buck, it's going to have a lot more power, for instance. And that, for some reason, um, or that is why people started dumbing down the training of their horses because they were afraid of that power through the back. So it all is part of the same thing. That is, if we don't, we have to work for that relaxation and the comfort of the horse so it's not trying to buck us off, if you will. And of course, why it's important that our bodies be in the correct position. So if something does happen, there's not a horse in the world that won't spook at something, you know. And when we have our body in the correct position by keeping our shoulders up, you know, for instance, instead of leaning forward when we rise, when it rises to the trot, we bring our hips forward as you are doing here. And you're doing a very good example of that. That is what keeps us on the horse. As soon as you go forward, the horse feels you out of balance. And, you know, if it wants to get rid of you, it's not a, a difficult process for it to do it. So you've done a wonderful job here with this horse. I really look forward to seeing um, what you do in the near future with this horse. But everything is exactly right on track with this horse. What a good trot you ended up with this. So I would have called that just about a perfect workout for this horse. He was starting to get a little tired. But look how good the walk looks at this very last part, especially when you came right back there. Now he starts to slow down a little bit, and you then you can lose it a little bit. But notice again how he stretches down, how much better the back end moves. And that's what we're always talking about. It's all about the movement. If what you're doing is destroying the movement to create a pretty head and neck set, you're not doing much. So this is Will Faber today. Wonderful job here, Olivia, with the source Chinook, and I look forward to seeing you in the not-too-distant future. Great, great job.